Episode 4, Escape. Jonathan Harker is a prisoner in the Castle Dracula. On this morning he awakes as from a dream. During the night, the Count has saved him from falling victim to the bloody lust of the Brides of Dracula. I awoke in my own bed. If it be that I have not dreamt, the Count must have carried me here. I tried to satisfy myself on the subject, but could not arrive at any unquestionable result. To be sure, there were several small evidences, such as that my clothes were folded and laid by in a manner which is not my habit. My watch was still unwound, and I am rigorously accustomed to wind it last thing before going to bed, and many such details. But these things are no proof, for they may have been evidences that my mind was not as usual. And from some cause or another, I had certainly been much upset. And now, I am captured by the thought of those awful women who were, who are, waiting to suck my blood. I have been down to look at that room again in daylight. The door was closed and locked, and it had been so forcibly driven against the jam that part of the woodwork was splintered. I fear it was no dream and must act on this surmise. Who is there? It is I, my friend. Yes. Well, uh, do, do come in. You will do me one favor, Mr. Harker. You will write three letters. One saying that your work here was nearly done and that you should start home within a few days. Another that you are starting on the next morning from the time of the letter. And the third that you had left the castle and arrived safely at Bistritz. It seems an odd request. Perhaps so. But in this country, the postings for mail are few and uncertain. Your writing now would ensure ease of mind to your friends. These letters will be held by the postal courier. But uh, my actual movements may not match those stated in the letters. I can easily hold their mailing, should you choose to extend your visit to my home. Uh, no. Perhaps you're right. It is settled. The letters will be mailed according to their dates. Their dates? The first should be June 12, the second June 19, and the third June 29. God help me. I now know the span of my life. He knows that I know too much, and that I must not live lest I be dangerous to him. There is a chance of escape, or, at any rate, of being able to send word home. A band of Sgaini have come to the castle and are encamped in the courtyard. They are gypsies. There are thousands of them in Hungary and Transylvania who are almost outside all law. They attach themselves to some great noble and call themselves by his name. Save for superstition, they are fearless and without religion. I have already spoken to them through my window to begin acquaintanceship. They took their hats off and made obeisance and many signs, which, however, I could not understand any more than I could their spoken language. I shall write two letters and will try to get the gypsies to post them. One letter to Mina, explaining my situation, written in shorthand, which the Count cannot read. The other to Mr. Hawkins, to communicate with Mina.
I have given the letters. I threw them through the bars of my window with a gold piece and made what signs I could to have them posted. The man who took them pressed them to his heart and bowed and then put them in his cap. With this I stole back to the study and have begun to read. To save my own life, I can do no more. A moment of your time, Mr. Harker. Enter, then. The Tskaney have given me these, of which, though I know not whence they come, I shall, of course, take care. See, one is from you and to my friend Peter Hawkins. The other, the other is made of strange symbols. It is a vile thing, an outrage upon friendship and hospitality. It is not so. The letter to Hawkins, that I shall of course send on, since it is yours, and your letters are sacred to me. Your pardon, my friend, that unknowingly I did break the seal. Will you not cover it again? Yes. Yes, of course. So, my friend, you are tired. Get to bed. There is the surest rest. I may not have the pleasure to talk tonight, since there are many labors to me. But you will sleep, I pray. I passed to my room with the thought that I would provide myself with some paper and envelopes from my bag and keep them in my pocket, so that I might write in case I should get another opportunity. But again a surprise. Again a shock. Every scrap of paper was gone, and with them all my notes, my memoranda relating to railways and travel, my letter of credit, in fact, all that might be useful to me were I once outside the castle. I then made a search of the wardrobe where I had placed my clothes. The suit in which I had traveled was gone, and my overcoat. As soon as I dared, I ran up the winding stair and looked out of the window which opened south. I thought I would watch for the Count, for there is something going on. In a short while, my watch was rewarded. I drew back and watched carefully and saw the whole man emerge. It was a new shock to me to find that he had on the suit of clothes which I had worn whilst traveling here. This, then, is his new scheme of evil, that he will allow others to see me and leave evidence that I have been seen in the towns or villages posting my own letters. I decided to wait for the Count's return, and for a long time sat doggedly at the window. A couple of hours had passed. I saw something stirring below. It was the Count, and now he carried a bag. It was the same heavy bag I had seen before with those ghastly women. I could see that the bag was not empty. This villain had once again claimed a small child from the village. Frolok! Stregvgolok! It was from below. In the courtyard, there, indeed, was a woman with disheveled hair holding her hands over her heart as one distressed with running. She was leaning against a corner of the gateway. When she saw my face at the window, she threw herself forward and shouted in a voice laden with menace. Monster! Give me my child! Can you help me? I am a prisoner! Beast! Empire! She accused me. Then... I realized the truth. The Count, wearing my clothes, had let himself be seen robbing this woman of her child. Even if I could escape the castle, should I show myself in the village, my death would be swift and terrible. Oh, madam, it was not I. There was no cry. 
and the howling of the wolves was but short. Before long, they streamed away singly, licking their lips. I could not pity her, for I knew now what had become of her child, and she was better dead. Then, from the Count's room, I heard something like a sharp wail quickly suppressed, and then there was silence, deep, awful silence chilled me. With a beating heart, I tried the door, but I was locked in my prison and could do nothing. I sat down and simply cried. Twenty-fifth of June, morning. No man knows till he has suffered from the night how sweet and how dear to his heart and eye the morning can be. When the sun grew high this morning, it struck the top of the great gateway opposite my window. The high spot which it touched seemed to me as if the dove from the ark had lighted there. My fear fell from me as if it had been a vaporous garment which dissolved in the warmth. I must take action of some sort whilst the courage of the day is upon me. Last night, one of my post-dated letters went to post. The first of that fatal series which is to blot out the very traces of my existence from the earth. Let me not think of it. It is time for action. It has always been at night time that I have been molested or threatened, or in some way in danger or in fear. I have not yet seen the Count in the daylight. Can it be that he sleeps when others wake? that he may be awake whilst they sleep. If I could only get into his room. But there is no possible way. The door is always locked. No way for me. Yes, there is a way, if one dares to take it. Where his body has gone, why not may another go? I have seen him myself crawl from his window. Why should not I imitate him and go in by his window? The chances are desperate, but my need is more desperate still. I shall risk it. At the worst, it can only be death, and a man's death is not a calf's, and the dreaded hereafter may still be open to me. God help me in my task. I have made the effort, and, God helping me, have come safely back to this room. Whilst my courage was fresh, I went straight to the window, and at once got outside on the narrow ledge of stone, and ventured out on the desperate way. I knew pretty well the direction and distance of the Count's window, and made for it as well as I could. In what seemed no time at all, I was there, at the Count's window, and slid silently into his chamber. It was barely furnished with odd things, and I found a great heap of gold in one corner. Gold of all kinds, Roman and British and Austrian and Hungarian and Greek and Turkish money, covered with a film of dust as though it had been laid long in the ground. None of it that I noticed was less than 300 years old. one corner of the room was a heavy door. It was open and led through a stone passage to a circular stairway, which went steeply down, lit only by loopholes in the heavy masonry. At the bottom, there was a dark, tunnel-like passage, through which came a deathly, sickly odor. At last, I found myself in an old ruined chapel, which had evidently been used as a graveyard. The roof was broken, and in two places were steps leading to vaults. But the ground had recently been dug over, and the earth placed in great wooden boxes, manifestly those which had been brought by the Slovaks. I made search for an escape way, but there was none. I went down even into the vaults where the dim light struggled, although to do so was a dread to my very soul. 
Into two of these I went, but saw nothing except fragments of old coffins and piles of dust. In the third, however, I made a discovery. There, in one of the great boxes, of which there were fifty in all, on a pile of newly dug earth, lay the Count. He was either dead or asleep. I could not say which, for the eyes were open and stony, but without the glassiness of death. And the cheeks had the warmth of life through all their pallor. The lips were red as ever. But there was no sign of movement. No pulse, no breathing, no beating of the heart. I bent over him and tried to find any sign of life, but in vain. He could not have lain there long for the earthy smell would have passed away in a few hours. By the side of the box was its cover, pierced with holes here and there. I thought he might have the keys on him, but when I went to search, I saw the dead eyes, and in them, dead though they were, such a look of hate, though unconscious of me or my presence, that I fled from the place and leaving the Count's room by the window, crawled again up the castle wall. Regaining my room, I threw myself panting upon the bed and tried to think. Twenty-ninth of June. Today is the date of my last letter, and the Count has taken steps to prove that it was genuine, for again, last night, I saw him leave the castle by the same window, and in my clothes. As he went down the wall, lizard fashion, I wished I had a gun or some lethal weapon that I might destroy him. But I fear that no weapon wrought alone by man's hand would have any effect on him. Soon after, I felt my exhaustion and laid down to dreamless sleep. I was awakened by the Count, who looked at me as grimly as a man can look. Tomorrow, my friend, we must part. You return to your beautiful England. Such a pleasant thought. And I shall not be here, but all shall be ready for your journey. In the morning come the Skaney, who have labors of their own here. And also come some Slovaks. When they have gone, my carriage shall come for you, and shall bear you to the Borgo Pass, to meet the diligence from Bukovina to Bistritz. But I am in hopes that I shall see more of you at Castle Dracula. Why may I not go tonight? Because, dear sir, my coachman and horses are away on a mission. But I would walk with pleasure. I want to get away at once. What of your baggage? Baggage? Tell me, my friend, what clothing would you suggest I carry? You English have a saying which is close to my heart. For its spirit is that which rules our land as well. Welcome the coming, speed the parting guest. How quaint. I see. Come with me, my dear young friend. Not an hour shall you wait in my house against your will. So sad am I at your going, and that you so suddenly desire it. Come. With stately gravity, he, with the lamp, preceded me down the stairs and along the hall. When we had reached the great door, he suddenly stopped. No, Mr. The wolves, with champing teeth and red jaws, came in through the open door. 
I knew then that to struggle at the moment against the Count was useless. With such allies as these at his command, I could do nothing. Still, the door continued slowly to open and the wolves came closer. Only the Count's body stood in the gap. Shut the door. I shall wait until morning. May I go to my room? As I have said, you are free to move as you wish, within or without the walls of my home. The last I saw of Count Dracula was his kissing his hand to me, with a red light of triumph in his eyes and with a smile of which the devil himself would be proud. When I was in my room and about to lie down, I thought I heard a whispering at my door. I went to it softly and listened. Unless my ears deceived me, I heard the voice of the Count. Back, back to your own place. Your time is not yet come. Wait. was a ripple of laughter, and I swear I could hear the terrible women licking their lips. I came back to my room and threw myself on my knees. Is it then so near the end? Thirtieth of June, morning. At last I felt that subtle change in the air and knew that the morning had come. Then came the welcome cockcrow, and I felt that I was safe. Once again, my fears melted away, and I determined to escape. Without a pause, I rushed up to the east window and scrambled down the wall as before into the Count's room. It was empty, but that was as I expected. I knew now well enough where to find the monster I sought. The great box was in the same place, and I knew I must reach the body for the key, so I raised the lid and laid it back against the wall. And then I saw something which filled my very soul with horror. There lay the Count, but looking as if his youth had been half renewed, for the white hair and moustache were changed to dark iron grey. The cheeks were fuller, and the white skin seemed ruby red underneath. The mouth was redder than ever, for on the lips were gouts of fresh blood, which trickled from the corners of the mouth and ran over the chin and neck. Even the deep burning eye seemed set amongst swollen flesh, for the lids and pouches underneath were bloated. It seemed as if the whole awful creature was simply gorged with blood. He lay like a filthy leech, exhausted with his repletion. I shuddered as I bent over to touch him, and every sense in me revolted at the contact. But I had to search, or I was lost. I felt all over the body, but could find no key. Then I stopped and looked at the Count. There was a mocking smile on the bloated face which seemed to drive me mad. This was the being I was helping to transfer to London, where amongst its teeming millions he may satiate his lust for blood. A terrible desire came upon me to rid the world of such a monster. There was no lethal weapon at hand, but I seized a shovel which the workmen had been using to fill the cases, and lifting it high, struck with the edge downward at the hateful face. But as I did so, the head turned and the eyes fell full upon me with all their blaze of basilisk horror. The sight paralyzed me, and the shovel turned in my hand and glanced from the face, merely making a deep gash above the forehead. The shovel fell from my hand across the box, 
and as I pulled it away, the flange of the blade caught the edge of the lid, which fell over again and hid the horrid thing from my sight. The last glimpse I had was of the bloated face, blood-stained and fixed with a grin of malice which would have held its own in the nethermost hell. I have returned to my room. There is in the passage below a sound of many tramping feet and the crash of weights being set down heavily. Doubtless the boxes with their freight of earth. There is a sound of hammering. It is the box being nailed down. Now I can hear the heavy feet tramping again along the hall with many other idle feet coming behind them. The door is shut. The chains rattle. There is a grinding of the key in the lock. I can hear the key withdraw. Then another door opens and shuts. I hear the creaking of lock and bolt. I am alone in the castle with those awful women. No. Mina is a woman, and these creatures are not. They are devils of the pit. I shall not remain alone with them. I shall try to scale the castle walls farther than I have yet attempted. I shall take some of the gold with me, lest I want it later. I pray God that I may find a way from this dreadful place, away from this cursed land where the devil and his children still walk. Goodbye, all. Goodbye, my fair Mina. <laughs>